So last week we began an extended mini trek through the book of Colossians. And this week we get a little more of that, jumping later into chapter 1. What I'm not sure I understand is why we're skipping the verses we skipped. My guess would be, and this was without really studying this too closely, that those verses show up somewhere else in the three-year series readings over the course of the year. So lest you hear the same passage twice, they, they didn't have it here. But the challenge is that it is kind of the key passage in the entire book, if you want to understand the book. I mentioned last week how Colossians is written to a town near Ephesus, a smaller town, unlike that big city, Ephesus, in which things are not quite as good for that congregation as they are at the larger, very faithful congregation in Ephesus. There is a heresy, a false teaching, being hmm, started, allowed to go on, tolerated in the congregation, called by scholars the Colossian heresy. And it is really in the verses that we skip, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, that that heresy is taken head on and smashed into a broken pulp of lies. The heresy is, and we talked about this last week as well, the idea that Jesus is not fully, completely, totally, entirely all God. He's some God, he's a little bit of God, he's like a God, any of those would kind of fit in. This heresy as it spreads throughout history, has taken a lot of different forms. But the, the main idea is that he's not all God. Either that, or he's not all man. One or the other, not, not both. So Paul, writing to counteract this, gives us some words that I think you will find these fairly familiar. He says, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of his body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God dwells bodily. And it pleased God to, through him, reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And then verse 21 says, And you who were once alienated. It goes, goes into how what Jesus has just done by the blood of his cross, declaring God's almighty peace to you, this one who is God himself in the mystery of the divine trinity that we cannot possibly understand, so we know he's not the Father, we know he's not the Spirit, we know he is the Son, we know all three are God, and yet they are distinct persons, whatever that might mean, they're not each other is what it means. This one of them came down among us, took on our flesh, let our sin be nailed into him on this cross, and by this made peace with God. Because God wanted to do that to you and everybody else. The trees, cows, mosquitoes. <laughs> Still want to do it to the mosquitoes. Angels. He made peace. He ended the war. That's why when he rises from the dead, he says, peace be with you to everybody who shows up. Now the war is over, is what he means by that. So what does this mean for you that this has happened? Well, that's where Paul's now going to go. And counter to the, the spirit of our age, it doesn't mean roses and butterflies and everything's great from now on out. Quite the opposite of that, really. It means, it means challenge and suffering. And never really having it the way you want it to be. Now, I know we're really spoiled as Americans. I get it. We can go out and buy a lot of what we want, right? I mean, none of us sit around and just endure a headache. Well, most of us don't. Huh? You go out and you get a Tylenol or ibuprofen or a Lib, whatever you want to do. Acupuncture. And you get rid of the headache. 
And so we can really end this practice of just kind of getting what we want when we need it, get in the habit of believing that this world can actually be that way all the time, forever, about all things, including and especially our what? Our spirits, our understanding of relationship with the divinity. Now, this is a, a difficult thing because we're kind of in between two ages as America right now as well. One age in which there was a, a real downplaying, a real anti-spirituality going on. Spirituality was kind of a thing over here. You maybe did it sometimes as your hobby or whatever. But more or less life is about kind of science, work, labor, economy, right? Very, very oriented on the rational. I don't know if you've noticed, uh, that's still there kind of. I don't think it's going to go away entirely, but we've really shifted our focus a little more onto what some people might call the spiritual. I mean, you can go downtown. There's a yoga studio right on the main street. And I got nothing against stretching and breathing. Nothing at all. But I guarantee you that there's a little more than stretching and breathing that goes on at the end of every single one of those sessions. There's a prayer at the end of every one of those sessions, a prayer to the universe and a prayer to each other. And lots of people go and they participate in that, and they do it because they believe the stretching and the breathing is actually good for their spirit. Now, I'm not sure it's not good for your life, so that's one thing, but they've confused well, the spirit of God with their body. It's a whole other topic in a sense. But it shows you how, at this time, people who are at the very least under 60, under 50, but maybe over as well, are much more open to the idea that life and spirituality are not segregated from each other. There is some need to feed the soul. Uh, it's not, we're not just a bunch of atoms bumping into each other. And even though they'll still talk about being all monkeys, uh, they believe these monkeys have fate, right? And the great power is leading us with this fate to a progressive future of some kind, some utopia, however we are going to find it. All of that being me saying that, in this, the hunger for this spiritual journey that we carry among us as Americans is still largely dependent upon our financial power. We do not have a spirituality which says you need to sacrifice some goats and make them bleed everywhere to the gods. Make sure before you're married, cut up the chicken and, and look inside its entrails to see if there's a good omen here so that your, your marriage can go well as these capricious gods will maybe bless you and maybe not. Uh, you don't really get that at all yet, right? It's all like we are light and goodness and come together unto a future of greatness. Right? That kind of thing is all we want right now. That is massively influenced by our being spoiled. We think we can have whatever we want. And so even though people are out there saying, I want to be spiritual, not religious, <laughs> they have utterly set themselves against the Spirit of God who comes and says, well, what you need is to be religious. You need a religion. And not just any, but the right one. The one that does not leave you alienated from God. With him there up above you, deciding in all perfect justice that you really should be squashed like that mosquito or like that fly. I gave a presentation at Higher Things. I won't do it all for you now. It took an hour. But it was about, it was titled, Not Letting the Zombie Apocalypse Get You Down. And the premise is pretty simple. It's that if you look at all the things the Bible says about sinful human condition, and you just take out the Bible words of it, and you take out the Christian and the devil part of it, and you just let the, the words that describe us as sinners stand by themselves, it's stunning. We're zombies. Zombies. Yeah. The venom of poison is in our lips. In our paths are ruin and misery. I mean, it's just zombies. So in the midst of this being a zombie, maybe the most important thing to recognize is, is not like, well, we're all undead walking around with our blood everywhere. No, no. But then when God looks down from heaven and sees us, that is what he sees, the way you would look at a movie with zombies in it. And if you see a horde of zombies coming toward your town, and I don't know if you're into zombie movies or not, but you know enough, right? If you see a horde of zombies coming toward your town, are you going to welcome them? Are you going to say, you know, you're such nice zombies. You know, you're not going to hurt anybody. You don't, mean, you don't mean it, right? As they gnaw on your neck. Turn you into one. No, you're going to go kill the zombies. Well, that's what a good God does to evil creatures. 
sinners. That we are that alienated from him. We are that separate from him. That's how bad it is. And that does show you, ultimately, how good Jesus is, by the way. That he is the one who walks out into the midst of the zombie horde, lets us devour him entirely, and in so doing, makes it so that when we devour him, his flesh and blood is a gift. Well, it doesn't turn him into a zombie. It turns us into living, living beings all over again. I don't want to take that analogy all the way. I'm just trying to emphasize the fact that Paul says we're alienated from God, and this is something we should take very seriously. And as much as the world is open to spirituality right now, nobody's out there telling them about the real one. We're in here struggling with getting our house in order instead, which is fine. You got to do that. But honestly, I did not accept the call to come here to get your house in order. We have to have the house in order so we can do the real thing, which is to, well, go attack the zombies. With the word of God, the sword of the spirit, the armor of light, empowered as, as his assembly to stand against the present darkness and to not be afraid of it. And in so doing, to see, well, to see zombies be transformed into Christians. Paul basically is saying the same concept here. Now, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So again, I've gone over the alienated part and the hostile part. Catch how it's hostile in mind toward God. We are naturally against him in what we think. And until his word crushes what we naturally think and replants in it what he would have us think, that's all we are. The word in the Bible for that is regeneration. Yeah? To regrow or to grow back. To have something that was dead come back to life. We were hostile. We've been regenerated. And this happens by this reconciliation in his body by his death. To reconcile is a very different kind of image, right? It is when you would have an enemy, someone who maybe used to be a friend, and the friendship fell out. Now it's awkward. You might be able to see each other here and there and kind of say, hey, how's it going? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Reconciliation is when, well, frankly, when you go and you say, I'm sorry. It was mostly me. You find a way to do that somehow. You take it on yourself, right? And you reestablish that relationship. And then they also receive it. Now, I don't want to get into, don't go back to being codependent and letting someone beat you. I mean, there are times for breaking relationships. There are times. But that image and that desire to reconcile with humans is, again, what God has done for you. Yeah? He has reconciled himself to you, saying... It's my fault. Kill me. Now, this doesn't mean it's actually his fault at all. It's not his fault at all. Huh? But he took it as if it was. And in so doing, has again restored you holy, set apart, right? We should know that word by now. It means to be set apart, holy. Holy and blameless. That's without flaw, without error, without a spot or blemish or wrinkle in you. Above reproach. No one can say an evil word about you. Now, I know uh, people can say evil words about you. They do it all the time, right? And some of them are probably deserved. Well, the point here is not that you're never going to have someone call you out on social media for being a jerk, if you are or you aren't. The point is that in the judgment hall of God on the last day, as he looks at every thought, word, and deed you have ever done, and the Satan, the accuser, is standing there trying to bring words against you, there won't be any. Because they've been taken away by the blood of Jesus. It's a powerful idea. Now, verse 23 does give us a little bit of a um, little sucker punch here. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, it says. Now, I'm not a big fan of the word if in general. If is the devil's word. It's, it's a doubt word. It's the word the devil uses when he comes to tempt Jesus. If you are the Son of God. And when the people are shouting at Jesus on the cross, they say, if you are the Son of God. It's trying to get you to doubt. 
And that's why I don't like the word, and I, I never want to translate that word as that word if it is not that word. <laughs> and in Greek, the, the funny thing about if is that sometimes it can mean because. It can mean because, and it depends on context. You have to have a little bit of your own theology that you're deciding, well, you know, how does other scripture teach me to see this? Well, the, the thing is, you could see this both ways, and it would still be faithful. But it's good to know that one is a law way and one is a gospel way. And you definitely, at the end of the day, want your heart to take comfort in the gospel way, even while you don't deny the law way. So let's do them in that order then. The law first. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the good news, the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. That word means servant. So all of this that I've said to you so far, about the blood of Jesus covering you, about God ending the war with you, about you no longer being a zombie, but regenerated entirely, about you being blameless on the day of judgment, that is all provided that you do not decide to not believe it. Because you still can. Every person in this room can still go to hell. That is the truth of the Holy Scriptures. And how does that happen? It happens when you start to put your trust in worldly things. And you do it a little bit here and a little bit there. And you think, I can keep Jesus too. I can serve God and mammon. It'll work out. Here we go. And next thing you know, you're on a wide road. There's a big crowd moving that way. Other people say, I'm a Christian too. I'm going this way. And you just keep going that way. And, well, you don't even know it. But by the end of it... The Jesus who you are claiming to believe in is not the actual one. And though you say, Lord, Lord, on the last day, he says, I don't know you. Go away, worker of iniquity. The part of the darkness prepared for you where the weeping and gnashing of teeth is. That's a terrifying, terrifying doctrine. Absolutely. And it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to make us remember who we are by nature. Have you heard the hymn, I walk in danger all the way? It's for that reason. And also, you know, the psalm that everyone loves, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, it leads to gospel in the psalm. I will fear no evil because, right? But the fact is, you're still in the valley of the shadow of death. And while Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you, that's the gospel, that's the electing power of God, you can make shipwreck of your faith, as Paul says. You can leave him or forsake him. That's the damning power of man. And we won't dive entirely into all the dogma of election this morning. just have to take it for what it is there. And that in this, he's giving warning to Christians that they can fall away. And so, with all that he said about the good news of who they are, they should be careful about what they, what they believe and what choices they make on the basis of this belief. Now remember, again, in the immediate context, he's telling them, some among you are teaching that Jesus isn't fully God. Well, if you go down that path, you're not in that path, right? Not in the right path. So that's, that's the, the particular thing he has. But it's fair warning for all of us. It's fair warning. Now, let's take it the gospel way. Let's say we translate this thing as because. I like it better that way. But again, I don't want to deny that what I just said was true, right? Don't, just because if this text doesn't mean that, it's still true other places in the Bible. But... Presented above reproach before him, because indeed you are in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation. Well, that's nice. Now I know I'm standing firm in the faith because I hear the gospel about Jesus, that this is steadfast and continues to be preached everywhere so that I, well, I will never fall away. And see, this is the electing side of it. I can tell you this too, isn't it? It's so weird, isn't it? You will never fall away. No one in this room is going to fall away so far as God is concerned. He is going to hold you by your baptism and drag you into salvation. That's true too. This is how far apart law and gospel really are when you break them down. This is why election gives so many other church bodies so much trouble. They're like, but that doesn't make sense. You just said two different things. Yeah, the Bible does. And one's law, one's gospel, one damns, one saves. Question is, which one are you going to hear? Which one are you going to hunger for? Which one are you going to not let be taken away from you? Paul moves on to emphasize suffering now. 
which is an interesting move. It's what leads me again to think that this is the because thing. I mean, he's, he's building them up initially here because he's going to tell them a little bit more of a challenging piece next. He says, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. Just pause on that one, right? Why don't, why don't young people tattoo this one on their arms? Right? You know, have you ever seen this? It's always like, uh, you know, for freedom I've been set free or something like that, right? Or when I am weak, then I am strong. How about I rejoice in my sufferings? What a thing. And of course, it helps here to remember that joy and comfort are kind of the same thing, right? It's not happiness. It's to have a comfort come upon you. So I take comfort in my sufferings for your sake, he says. Now, I think what he means here is that as the apostle, as I know about who you are and your needs, and I struggle over here or over here with this well, people throwing stones at me and stuff that was happening to him, he says, in the midst of that, I am comforted because I know what I'm doing with these words is for you. And so I can handle the suffering because it's for you, right? That makes a little more sense. It's not as though all suffering in the Christian life makes sense, though. So we can't quite go that way entirely. But it is a key thought. James says it this way at the start of his letter. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance produces faith. Faith produces hope. Hope does not give up. So to suffer is a central, an absolute part of Christian spirituality. It's a, it's a part of our devotion. And that's kind of the scariest thing maybe about being an American Christian. It's so easy for us to get rid of the suffering. What happens to our faith once we no longer need a God to save us? How long can the sinful flesh be held off when I never have to battle my own brokenness or my own pain or my own rage, my own evil? How long can the zombie continue to be alive when he's no longer getting the medicine? Especially if the medicine, again, is his suffering. He even goes further to say this is part of, part of Christ's atoning of him. This is a very strange verse, so I encourage you to pay very close attention to this one again. So he starts off 24, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of the body that is the church of which I became a minister. It goes on from there. But, but what? wait a minute. What, did he just say that Christ's atonement on the cross was lacking something? That's weird. And if you understood it the way I just said it, it's actually wrong. He didn't say that. There is no lacking atonement. No? But it's kind of the other way around. It's that we look at the cross and we think that it was just that, right? The single moment in time. Kind of the way we look at baptism, we think it's just that moment with the water. But from God's perspective, and this is what Revelation's all about, by the way, behind the scenes, there's a whole lot more going on. And this moment at the cross is an epic, ages-long battle between the heavenly powers of light and darkness in which Satan, the deceiver, is being cast down by Michael's spear, thrown into the abyss and locked with a chain. And that is also happening in time and space for us, not by watching angels and demons fight in the sky, but by these words about Jesus' death and resurrection flying through our ears and brains and heads and mouths person to person to person throughout history while all the world tries to lie it out of us. That then, every time it comes into you, fills up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions by extending it to you. It's like a flood of suffering, this cross of Jesus, pressing forward. Not to make you suffer more, per se. It's more just to, well, open your eyes to see how bad being a zombie really is. I mean, it's, <laughs> brushing your teeth is a little tougher, let me tell you. Thanks for the giggle, appreciate it. <laughs> So, Paul says, though, as he becomes aware of this sin living in him, he takes comfort in knowing that it is Christ affirming the fact that he knows this is not how he's supposed to be, and that the fullness of Christ covering him is sufficient, 
but that he is free to endure it and even hold himself back so that others might receive these same words, the same comfort, and believe. And so he points to the body, the church, right? All Christians in every place. And he says that he is, again, it's twice he said it now, a minister, a servant of that church. The word even can be translated as slave. The use of the word minister to describe a pastor is a good one. A slave of the word. Yeah? For your sake, not free. Not free to say what I think. Not free to have my opinions. Not when the word of God is concerned. Huh? And anytime I speak to you, I should always distinguish. This is the word of God I'm saying right now. And this is Jonathan's silly opinion. Not free. And that is that you might be built up. According to the, this is the rest of 25, stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now, Paul has this in a special way. We've talked about this enough recently. I won't go into it too far. But the apostles clearly have a special stewardship from God. That's why we kept all their letters and call them the Bible, right? They wrote it down like that's inspired. That's inerrant. We trust that. Your pastor doesn't have that. I've written a couple books. They're not so bad, but they're not going to be in the Bible ever. Yeah? Uh, so he has a special stewardship. With that said, the minister of the church also does have a special stewardship, which is to be the guy who refuses to not say what the Bible says at all costs, even if you kill me, yeah? even if you run me out. I'm glad God sends these men to us, Paul, the apostles, and others. I wouldn't be here without one who's not me. I'm glad that we're having the opportunity to perhaps train a few more to go out and die. Paul says that he is making this word of God known, and then he goes off, right? He goes back into gospel here now. The mystery, verse 26, hidden for ages and generations, now revealed to his saints. Remember, as I talked about, behind the cross, there's this mysterious war going on. And now it's revealed to his saints means holy ones, right? So we're back on the set apart. Those who are brought into Christianity, set apart for Christianity. He has made this mystery known. But what's that? What's the mystery? Verse 27. To them, that's us, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it's it's kind of a two-part thing. The first is surprising to the first generation of Christianity, those who largely were coming out of Judaism. And it's the mystery that God wasn't just going to save one man or one family or one people group, but that his intention was indeed to save the entire world. That's the mystery hidden for ages, now revealed in Jesus. Now we know it. So you, who are not Jews by birth, are indeed children of Abraham, sons and daughters in faith through Jesus. That's the first part. But then the second part is just the Jesus part. (laughs) That God has sent his own son in order to be our God, but more than that, being your God to be one with you. And that... That's a stunning idea. It's not like Zeus or Kronos or Thor. Off somewhere again, capricious, kind of like us. By taking on our flesh, he brought humanity into God himself permanently, right? So God's a man now, really and for sure. So that's the first part. And then he takes that flesh, his body, and he mysteriously, gives it to you in bread and wine so that this bread, which is God and man, is now one with you. And you swallow him. And your stomach does what your stomach does with him, veiled in the bread and wine, and goes and sends those nutritious pieces out into your yourself. So that when God looks down from heaven, he doesn't see only you. He sees Jesus. I know you were told that in Sunday school, right? God sees Jesus, not you. But it was always like this idea. No, no, it was like actually happening. He sees Jesus. The mystery of glory that is Christ in you. So that as Christ says in John chapter 6, If anyone eats my flesh and drinks my blood, 
I shall raise him up on the last day. I mean, think about it that way. You're going to die at some point, right? I mean, unless he comes back and the twinkling of the eye thing happens, you're going to die. It's probably going to hurt. It's going to happen. And then you're going to smell. And because you're going to smell, we're going we're gonna to put makeup on you and like take out some of your guts and then put a bunch of chloroform on you so we can get everybody from all over the country here to watch you dead. Kind of weird that we do this, huh? Um, and then we're going to show you off a little bit. Dead body. There you are. And then we're going to take you and we're going to put you as far away from us as possible. Huh? Go way out there and way down there so that we don't have to look at you. We don't have to smell you. That's going to then stay there. You will stay there with worms, if you're there long enough, eventually finding their way in, eating you. I heard recently, I thought this was so fascinating. They discovered, uh, it, was in, it was in New England. They discovered a, uh, an old cemetery that had kind of been overgrown by a, a, a forest. And they did it on accident somehow. I think they were clearing the forest or something, some of the, some of the grove. And they found this coffin and the coffin had been basically split open and dissolved. And then there were just the tree roots there. And the tree roots had taken on precisely the form of a human skeleton. Because it had eaten the entire body. A little bit at a time. Isn't that something? Just stunning to me. From dust you were taken, to dust you shall return. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. Even with the tree eating all the parts and all this kind of stuff, right? If it would cut you up, put you on fire, burn you, throw in the ocean, Right? doesn't matter. If you have eaten the flesh and blood of Christ, if the mystery of Christ's glory is in you, then when the last day comes and that archangel shouts and the trumpet sounds for all the world, your body, which is no longer just your body, will have no choice but to get up. You will rise completely and totally victorious. And now, I don't mean deified like you're going to be God. That's not right. But like unto a God compared to how you feel right now. Like unto a God because you are one with God who is in you. So much more than just that kind of peace like a river in my soul thing. So much better than that. This, him we proclaim, verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Maturity in the faith. We are entering a time where if you are not mature in your faith, the jeopardy to your faith is only going to increase. There was a day in an age when you could walk around a fairly ignorant Christian and have no threats to what you believed in this country. That day is gone. It's been gone. And I'm really not afraid to say it for those of you who are young, you know what scares me most? College. It terrifies me. Because they're going to try to take your faith. And it's happened. It's happened and happened and happened and happened, and we keep watching it happen. It terrifies me. For those of you who are no longer going to college, why are we not talking about this? What's going on? How have we been unprepared for this? The darkness is stealing us. As a congregation, we're at this point today where that meeting is going to happen because for what, years? I don't know how long. I was not here. But you weren't hearing what I just said. And so you died. You became immature and you died. I, I, I marvel that you're even still here at all, by the way. I really do. How are there any Christians left? I don't know. But you are. You are. And that's, that's grand hope here, right? But because that's grand hope and because it's enough to stand on, we must all the more be totally convicted. This isn't just about getting our budget in order. That's just what we're supposed to do because it's the right thing to do. This is about the fact that we are immortals, standing set apart from the age of darkness the zombie hordes that are driving themselves insane and unto death, and that we're not going to put up with it. I'm not going to put up with it. I'm going to speak against it. I don't believe I'm going to speak alone. 
but you should know by this point, the reason I'm here is because I am going to speak it to you, and it is, that is, your maturity in the faith is the only thing I actually care about. In the name of Jesus, amen.